many people here are on D star? Okay, we got a smattering. How many of you have heard of D star? <laughs> How many of you can spell D star? <laughs> Rats. How many of you have a D star radio that you've never used? No. That's a good question. How many are buying D star today? Yeah. After this session, we should. <laughs> okay. Um, I got started with D-Star about four years ago. I'd been studying it for about three years before that, and I got caught up in the, the trap that a lot of people get caught up in. Well, it's not all open source and stuff like that. And uh, when you really get down to it, there's one component of the standard for D-Star that isn't uh, uh, open, and that's the codec. And that's because it's the best one in the world, and it costs $20 to buy it on a chip. So, uh, it, you know, your radios have all kinds of proprietary parts in it, you know, processors, transistors, resistors, capacitors. All of those are owned intellectual property of somebody. And, and the same is true with the chip. One of the things that really appealed to me was a um, little background. I was one of the pioneers of AX25 packet radio, and even before that I did VADC, which is the uh, Canadian uh, predecessor to AX25. Um, and I'd always been fascinated by this concept that I should be able to pick up my radio and talk to who I want to talk to. And D-Star has that facility. It's called uh, call sign routing. Basically, uh, you put the call sign of the station you want to talk to into what's called the your field or the destination field of your radio. You key the mic, go through the repeater, and the network just figures out where your buddy is and you talk to them. Well, that was uh, 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 part of what got me interested in it. Uh, the other was the medium speed data, 128k k bits per second uh, up on 23 centimeters. Uh, but we got sidetracked with something called linking, because that's what people are familiar with. You know, they've done the echo link, they've done IRLP, they've done uh, a variety of uh, uh, RF links and so on. So, for quite some time I thought about how do we make this call sign routing so it's more useful to groups of people. You know, the one-on-one -on -one works really good if you just put the other person's call sign in and you talk to them. And, they talk back to you, but as hams, we tend to be antisocial on one level and very social on another <laughs> level, and and we tend to like to do things like nets, and we tend to like to do um, a lot of public service with Aries and races and, and uh, various other uh, public service events, and so I noodled on this for oh, a couple years actually. Um, Professionally, I run an IT organization, which means I have very little time for coding. <laughs> so I worked with a fellow out of the UK, uh, G4KLX, Jonathan Naylor, who also was a pioneer in packet, incidentally. Um, and we came up with something that we've branded StarNet Digital. StarNet Digital uh, combines the uh, capabilities of call sign routing with um, uh, with this notion of we tend to do things as groups. But to give you a little background, it's dependent on a couple of things uh, that are all DSTAR compliant and compatible. The first is something called IRC DDB. IRC DDB, one of the promises of DSTAR was that if you moved from repeater to repeater and you keyed up, the network should be able to find you. The problem was, is the implementation was too slow. Initially, you would move from one repeater to another, and it might take two hours before the network knew you had moved. Okay. Now, they've worked on that, and it's down to about 10 to 20 minutes now. But that's not really good if you got a 20-minute commute, and you have to go through three repeaters while you're at it. So, some really bright guys in, in Germany uh, got together and they created something called IRC DDB. 
And what IRCDDB does is there's a little piece of software that gets installed on each gateway and it listens for the traffic coming in off of the repeaters into that gateway. And it picks it up and it retransmits it on a broadcast channel using what's called the IRC protocol, which if any of you have been on the internet for more than 30 years, like some of us, uh, is the old way you used to do chat between people. And so it sends where the stations have shown up out on this channel, and all the other gateways listen to it and make note, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, NH6Z just moved from the Corvallis repeater to the Portland repeater. And now whenever I try to call him, it knows where he is instantly. I mean, it, I, I've sat there and watched this channel, and keyed up on one repeater, gone to another, keyed up on another repeater. I can hit about eight repeaters from my house, seven or eight repeaters from my house. And, um, and, and literally, by the time I take the PTT off, all the repeaters are updated as to where my station is now. So, uh, IRCDDB was designed to solve that problem. Um, for those of you that are in the open source community, uh, it's all open source. It's written in Java. You can go in and look at what they're doing, make sure they're not doing anything nasty. Uh, you can modify it if you really must. Um, and the module that they wrote uh, works just fine with the ICOM gateway, and it's okay with the guys that run the U.S. Trust if you put it on your ICOM gateway, and it runs just fine on G4ULF's um, gateway that he wrote, which uh, a number of stations use as well. Um, as users, you don't have to do anything. It's The main thing is making sure that your repeater administrator has installed this on their gateway. If they've installed it, that's all you need. no special registration or anything like that. These are the guys in Germany, great guys. We, uh, uh, when I say they're regularly available by email, chat, and voice telephony, they are. Uh, they have lives too and they're 10 hours off of us. But I get on at 11 o'clock at night as they're getting out of bed and, and we chat back and forth about um, the work that they're doing. Uh, one thing that they did from the very beginning in their design was they wanted redundant servers in multiple data centers, so if one goes down, the other one just picks up the load. And initially they had a, a cluster in Germany, and now there's a second cluster. Uh, most of them are in Canada, but there's uh, a couple in uh, Wisconsin or Minnesota or someplace up in that area. Anyway, we've got this totally redundant network now uh, that carries on uh, all the traffic. So no one thing can take it down. One thing that uh, arose was it, it, it keeps everybody up to date so quick and you can capture the history of them that uh, some folks built databases where you can kind of look at the history of a person getting on the net and a few, you could count them on one hand, <laughs> Europeans complained about this and so they added a feature uh, this is one thing that you need to do if you want to watch your traffic on the network. Because you have to put in the URR call sign uh, one time, VIS on, for visualization on, key your mic, and then you'll show up on the network. Otherwise, it defaults to off. They're trying to get it where it's an opt-out instead of an opt-in, but they're, they're having their national uh, club take that to their government and make sure that they're not stepping on anybody. Okay, so that's the basis. You can install this on ICOM and you can install it on G4 and LF. If you're building a homebrew repeater, and I'll show you how that's done at the end of this, um, there are some other options. And one of them is called the IRCDDB Gateway. It doesn't use the U.S. Trust infrastructure at all. It just collects all the information off of IRCDDB and um, keeps all the rate routing information that way. It supports uh, multiple repeater platforms. 
Uh, if you have an ICOM uh, RP2C running an ICOM stack, it talks to it just fine. In fact, in Seattle, we have a repeater at 63 floors in downtown Seattle that runs this software with an ICOM repeater. Okay. Uh, ICOM software is fine. I'm just saying, here's an option. Um, some of you may have heard of node adapters or hotspot adapters or uh, not quite <coughs> any hotspot adapters. They're all the same thing. It's basically a GMSK modem on a board that you plug into a USB port and it generates the modulation signal for the star and demodulates the signal and sends it back and forth as a digital stream into a computer. So you can build a repeater doing that. I've done that. Kenny's going to do that here this week. <laughs> as soon as he gets home Sunday night. Uh, <laughs> there's a few other people. Uh, uh, Jeremy's built one that way. Um, uh, Kenny and I are using Kenwood repeaters. Uh, Jeremy's using a tape. There's a couple of tapes out for sale on the floor here. Um, I'm supposed to tell him that, but I can't tell him. Well, you just got to be quicker than us. <laughs> well, and you just passed the bar, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you're really cheap, <laughs> I've never known a cheap ham, uh, you, can, you can use a sound card. But you can't use the expensive sound card. You have to get a cheap sound card. 